I'm satisfied, but I'm getting bored when I talk about doing the things that you ask of us. It's so, it's so passive. It's, you're not just asking us to do things, you're requiring us to do things. You're not, you're not preferring that we lay our lives down as living sacrifices. No, you said it's our reason why I can worship. It's what's, it's what's reasonable. It's, it's what's expected is the life laid down and sacrificed for you, for your service, for your good pleasure. And God, that does bring you good pleasure. So may we be obedient to the things that you require today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. So you're not allowed to play that song again right before I come up. <laughs> That's my song. I need to compose myself here and, uh, and get ready to, to bring the word. So if you have your copy of God's word, we're going to be at Deuteronomy 18 today. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. And I feel like we're extra blessed today. Uh, the Doyles are back. Amen. And not only that, the verdicts are back from JRTC. No worse for the wear, not a dent in the fender. Now if we could just get Randall here. Randall's back out on the road. If we could get Randall here at the same time, I feel like there would just be a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit right here on Sunday morning. So Randall, if you're driving, pay attention. Keep your eyes on the road. And uh, listen, by all means, but don't, don't watch. Please watch the road. So again, welcome. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. And I am excited to be here this morning. And, uh, and there is really, literally no place I would rather be this morning than right here with my brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping the Lord. There's literally nowhere else I would rather be this morning than right here with you all. So, let's get into, uh, into Deuteronomy 18. And today I'm going to talk about a particular, you know, anytime you get to the text, it has a singular meaning, but it has a, an infinite wealth of uh, application. And so one of the chores of preaching is to determine what does the Lord feel like the application you need to end up on today. And it impressed upon me as we were, uh, as I was studying through Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy 18 this week, uh, that I needed to talk about something that I think probably you all struggle with, and that's pride. I don't personally struggle with pride, so, but I'm sure there's somebody here uh, that may struggle with pride. I see a few smiles out here. Uh, so perhaps you all struggle with pride. I, you know, maybe you can tell me about that struggle afterward, uh, what that's like. I'm sure that's very difficult, challenging to struggle with pride. But I felt led to talk about pride because pride is so pervasive uh, in, in humanity in a number of different ways. And it's pervasive in some ways that are obvious. And we're going, we're going to gloss over some of the obvious ways that pride is pervasive and prevalent in, in humanity and perhaps delve into some areas where it's not as obvious. And I'm praying that the Lord would speak to us this morning uh, from the words of Deuteronomy 18. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 15, as we talk about being humble. The Word says, The Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses speaking. This is Moses speaking. He says, from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, speaking to Moses, from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So again, we are back in our sermon series, First Love, as we are turning to Moses and the prophets to learn and remind ourselves about our first love, Jesus, just like the church at Ephesus did. And as we remember, when we discover where we have forgotten, we will repent of forgetting about our first love, Jesus. And so as we have waded through Moses and the prophets, learning about Jesus, one of the first things we learned was about ourselves. We learned about our own helplessness before a holy and righteous God. And then in the weeks preceding that and after that, we learn all these different characteristics about Jesus. Not focusing on what he has done yet, but focusing upon who he is. 
And so today when we turn to this prophecy, we're going to again learn something about ourselves as we look about Jesus and we talk about being humbled. Now, this is from Deuteronomy. This is the second giving of the law. So the, the, the people are preparing to uh, accomplish God's, or God's preparing to accomplish his promise through the people of the Holy Land, of giving them the Holy Land. And it's interesting that, that everybody's dead by now, except for Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. Everybody else is dead. And so God is giving them the law again through the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses is giving it to the people. And here he says that he gives this prophecy, Moses does, that the Lord will raise up a prophet like me, talking, Moses is talking about himself, and it is to him you shall listen. Well, he's talking about Jesus, but how do we know that he's talking about Jesus? So if you come on Wednesday nights and you are in our How to Study the Bible uh, lesson on Wednesday nights, you learned that one of the fundamental aspects of Scripture is that we always interpret Scripture with Scripture. That is a fundamental aspect of of theology or of studying the Bible is interpreting scripture with scripture. So how do we know this is talking about Jesus? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 3, in this particular account, Peter and John are going about their business. They come across a man who is crippled and they decide to heal this man. And then after healing, the people are astounded that they were able to heal this man. And so they come and Peter stands up and he gives this testimony to who Jesus is, and in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, speaking about Jesus, he quotes, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. Here he quotes Deuteronomy 15, talking about Jesus. This is the apostle Peter. If you take a right your Bible, you go to Acts chapter 7, the very first Christian martyr, who is Stephen, interestingly a deacon in the church, and he, it says that he is full of grace and power. He's doing great wonders and signs among the people. The people are offended by this, and so they trump up charges against him. They take him before the religious council, and Stephen gives this long, great speech-slash-sermon testifying to who Jesus is. And in verse 37 of Acts chapter 7, he says, This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From your brothers, talking about Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 18. Even John the Baptist in John chapter 1, the people come to John the Baptist, the religious leaders, and they say, are you Elijah? And he says, no. They say, are you the prophet? And he says, no. And they're referencing Deuteronomy 18. And John goes on to tell them all about Jesus. This prophecy is pointing ahead to Jesus that he would be one like Moses. Now that's interesting to think about a prophet, about Jesus being like a man, Moses. And really, uh, we've got we to be careful how we say that. And if you go to Hebrews chapter 3, what we see is that Moses is a precursor to Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. He's a forerunner of Jesus. But he's a man, so he's less than Jesus. As Hebrews chapter 3 tells us in verse 3, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. And so we can look to Moses and we can see some characteristics of Jesus, but Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is the one who is above all things. And so we see that from Hebrews chapter 3, again, talking about this prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So I wanted to look at a couple of different ways. And we could actually camp out on this singular verse for a number of Sundays, talking about the ways that Jesus is like Moses, and it's really that Moses is like Jesus, but the wording is that Jesus is like Moses. Moses is the lawgiver. Moses is the lawgiver. God came to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave to him the law, and Moses is the one who gave that law to the people, and it references that here, and it references Exodus chapter 20, when Moses gave them the law, and there was, there was a cloud, and there was fire, and there was thunder, and the people begged Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. You talk to us. Don't let God speak. Is that the Holy Spirit? Don't let God speak to us anymore. That could be this way. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, don't let God speak to us anymore, the people said. Well, additionally, in James chapter 4, verse 12, James says about Jesus... James chapter 4, verse 12, 
that there is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. So Jesus is the ultimate lawgiver, though Moses gave the law originally. Moses was a liberator. Moses was a liberator. He liberated his people, God's people. God came to Moses with the strict instructions to set my people free. And he commissioned him to lead the people into freedom. Jesus is a liberator. He comes out of 40 days of fasting in the first, and he's confronted with, with Satan while he's fasting. And the first place he goes is to the synagogue, and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And right there in church, he stands up, and he begins to quote the prophet Isaiah about himself. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Moses was a liberator. Jesus is the liberator. Moses was a mediator. Time and time again, he got on his face and he prayed for God to have mercy upon the people. They would transgress. They were doing different things, offending God in different ways. And God was prepared to judge them. But Moses got on his face and he interceded for them. He was an interceder. He was an intercessory. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Jesus Christ. These are just a few ways that Moses is like Jesus or Jesus is like Moses. That Jesus is the ultimate lawgiver, the ultimate liberator, the ultimate mediator. But when I was thinking about Moses and the ways that Moses is like Jesus, I came across an interesting verse in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. And remember, we believe that Moses authored these words, authored these, authored these books. When he says about himself in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, there is no man more humble than Moses on the face of the earth. This is Moses writing this about himself. That's an interesting Statement, right? I mean, what do we do with this statement? Moses testifying to his own humility. Now, again, we can dig into the language a little bit. And some say that the language doesn't necessarily mean humble. It means meek or even afflicted. And he was right in the middle of being opposed by Miriam and his own brother Aaron. So he was his, his own people that he loved were rising up against him. And so he felt downtrodden, but he calls himself meek, afflicted, and or humble. But we acknowledge the inerrancy of Scripture, that all Scripture is true. And so Scripture tells me that Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. I take it for what it says, that he was, in fact, a humble man. And I see no account of any pride within Moses throughout his, uh, throughout his life that's recorded in Scripture. I mean, you can maybe make some arguments about some of the things that happened. And he's a man, so I'm sure there was pride there at some point in time. But it reminded me of the humility of Jesus. And what do we do with this? Because he says he's going to raise up a prophet like Moses who is humble, and we should listen to him. What does that mean for us? Is there a sin more pervasive than pride? I was joking about pride in the beginning. But is there a sin that infects more people more so than pride that is absolutely universal in scope and application and that has profound implications in the things that pride accomplishes? The things that pride does, the thing that, that, that pride affects from our relationships with those we love to most of all our relationship with the Lord. Pride is such an important thing to talk about. Now, the first thing, and, and, and we see it in some different areas. Uh, I'm going to talk about the most obvious area first, pride in the world. Well, we know this, right? I mean, we know that the world is full of pride. I mean, think about Satan himself, the, the, the author of sin, the author of, of all of these things beforehand. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 17 tells us that, that Satan was proud. He was proud in his heart because he was Beautiful, And it tells us that Satan sought to rise to the heights of God. He was not content to be under God, to be under God's authority, to be subordinate to God. He wanted to be like God. 
And what does he do? He goes to, after his fall, after he's cast out of heaven, he goes to the woman in the garden. And what does he offer her? Now, you can debate about what the very first sin was. Was it the doubt that he induced? Did he leverage the doubt to pray upon her pride? Or did he leverage her pride to, to induce doubt? I mean, you can kind of argue about which way that, that goes. But it's clear that pride is a part, a fundamental aspect of the fall. He says to her, you can be like God. This was the very thing he said to himself. I want to be like God. I'm not content to exist under the authority of God. I'm not content to be underneath of God. I want to be like God. And we see that today. Paul writing in Romans chapter 1 when he condemns the sin of men who are underneath the wrath of God. He tells us what the universal sin of men is. And that is that we have exchanged... The truth about God for a lie. And we have worshipped and served the created thing rather than the creator. We worship and serve the created thing. Ourselves above the creator. You know, a lot of people will look at the pervasive sin in our world and they'll say, well, God is going to judge our nation. They'll look at things like the proliferation of alternative lifestyles, homosexuality, the destruction of gender norm, abortion, and all these different things. They'll look at these things and say, God is going to judge our nation because of these things. And I say, no, that those things are the judgment of God upon our nation. God has already judged our nation. Because we have traded the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the created thing ourselves above and beyond the creator. And all of those things and all of the licentiousness and destruction that comes along with those things is the judgment of God upon our nations. Very clear from Romans chapter 1. And what we see is that men individually raise themselves up against God, but we even do it collectively. We do it collectively. Listen to Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage in vain and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. We see people individually worshiping themselves instead of God. We see nations raising themselves up and seeking to, to set themselves up against God. There is pride throughout the world. We know this. Pride in how you look. Think about how much time and effort we spend putting into how we look, our appearance before other men. Pride in the things that we have and in, in our possessions. Pride in what you do. I was a member formerly of perhaps the most prideful group of people that I've ever met. And I'm talking about army officers. And we have some army officers here in this. And, and so you think about, and not just the arm, army officers, army in general, think about the army officers that I can't just do something good. I can't just do a good thing. You've got to give me something to put on my chest. So I can look, look, at, look at the good thing that I did. I can't just go learn a new skill or acquire a new, I, I got to put something so I can show, look, look, at, look at what I did. Look at what I did. We exalt the pride of men. We leverage the pride of men in order to get them to do things that they otherwise may not do. Pride is so powerful. Other people's opinions of it. But we know all these things. This is JV stuff. I want to get past the JV stuff and really dig a little bit deeper when we talk about pride. Because we know this. this. This is rookie stuff. Let's see if we can go a little bit deeper. That's the world. Pride in the world. Let's get in the church. Let's talk inside the church a little bit. How about pride in our works? Pride in our works. This hit home to me this week. So lest we forget, Jesus, uh, he, he reserved his harshest condemnation for those who would otherwise elevate their own works. The, the Pharisees, other religious leaders who took the law, twisted the law and made it about something that it was never intended to be. The law was intended to set Israel apart. The law was intended to teach them who they were, to teach them that they were, in fact, in need of an all-sufficient Savior. So they took commands like, you know, don't, don't honor don't work on the Sabbath, you know, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Oh, well, there's a sick man, you know, he need, but I, I can't work on the Sabbath, so I won't take care of this. So they elevated their works, and it was through their own pride. And Jesus reserved his harshest condemnation for them. But we all have a little bit of Pharisee inside us, right? That, and usually it's reserved, it's, it's most evident in our condemnation of other people. Well, did you see what so-and-so did? The, the sin is 
uh, or this other sin that this person, or you, you can't believe they got divorced. I mean, they're believers, and they and, and so we see the inner Pharisee coming out inside of us in different ways, and we really see the elevation of pride and works. Historically, I'll give you a quick history lesson in the institutionalization of works, the institutionalization in the church. And I'm talking about church traditions, the elevation historically of church traditions in the words of men. There's a cursed doctrine called papal infallibility that raises the words of a single man, the Pope, to on par with Scripture. This was the nexus of the, the Protestant Reformation. This is why we had the Reformation, is that people were resisting the elevation of works. To a position that they were never designed to be. And, and it's kind of interesting as you see the fallout from the Reformation. All of the de denominations came from the Reformation. But many of the denominations did not fall far from that tree. I had a conversation last week with a man who has been uh, faithfully attending one of these particular denominations. And I'm not going to name the denomination uh, but he's been faithfully attending a church from this denomination for literally 30 years. Every Sunday he's there. He's in Bible studies. When the doors are open, he's there. And I ask this man, do you know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is? And he looked at me and said, no. This is a tragedy. That this man can sit underneath of preaching in, in a body of believers and not know what the gospel of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is. I had another discussion just the week prior to that with another man who attends another denomination that's very similar in nature. <clears throat> and he was really struggling with this idea of his sin being as bad as everybody else's sin. That, that, that his sin condemns just as much equally as, say, the, the, the serial killer or somebody who could, He was really struggling with this idea. And he quotes me what his pastor said to him. His pastor said to him, no man is as good as they think they are, but no man is as bad as they think they are. He says this to me from his pastor, and I'm thinking to myself, do these people even read Scripture? How do they get this from Scripture? And it reminded me instantly of Galatians 6.14 where Paul says, By no means will I boast of anything other than our Lord Jesus. The very foundation of the Reformation, the solas of, of the Reformation, Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone. Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Our religious works can become just a, a part of our prideful boasting, even good works. I remember Spurgeon says, he, this is a prince of preachers, this is arguably the greatest preacher ever. He's coming off the stage, and a woman comes to him, and she's like, she's like that was the greatest sermon I ever heard on that particular topic. And he says, man, thank you. Uh, Satan just whispered that very thing in my ear just about a minute ago. That this would be the greatest sermon ever. He had disdain for that view. That we could somehow elevate our works. And the culmination of the elevation of our works through our pride. Is what we see in the church today. That is a church that has fallen into irrelevancy. A church that is irrelevant to our culture. A church that is in many ways impotent in our culture. Think about the message. It's moralism. It's not the gospel. It's moralism. Do good. Do good is a hollow message. It's an empty message. And most of all, it is a message that does not save. Because that message is indistinguishable from the message of every single other organization. Every single other institution. Everything has the message of do good. That's an empty message. It's a useless message. And it is a message that does not save. But it is the message of the modern church in many areas. And it's based upon our pride in our own works. It's based upon our pride. But here we see that God is going to raise up Jesus, who was humble. We ought to listen to him. We see pride in the world, pride in our works. <coughs> we see pride in the will. In many ways, the will is like the culmination of 
our pride. This is like the last bastion of us defending against this assault upon our pride. I mean, do men cling more tightly to anything other than the will or their notion of free will? What does that even mean? Again, you go back to the Reformation. The heart of the Reformation was exactly that, a debate upon the will. One of the fathers of the Reformation, Luther, wrote a book entitled The Bondage of the Will. And he had a series of running debates with a man named Erasmus who talked about the freedom of the will. <coughs> it's interesting when you think about the will. And, and, and again, as Joe and I were talking this week, some ways the will is semantics. It depends on what you mean by certain things. But when people say free will, what they usually mean is will that is ungoverned. That I can make decisions totally ungoverned, not based upon anything else other than what I desire. That is not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that the will, our desires, is always enslaved to our nature. Prior to my salvation, <coughs> prior to my salvation, my will is enslaved to my sin. It tells us that the heart is desperately wicked. Who could possibly understand it? Now, once I'm saved, then I, I have a choice. I can either sin or I cannot sin. But when I have, choose to sin after salvation, I have to violate my own nature. I have to violate the new nature that God has given to me. I have to go against that nature. And as we are sanctified, it should become harder and harder to do that particular thing. <coughs> Here's the issue with this. Here's the issue. When we elevate the will through the pride of men, what that naturally leads to is a faulty view of Jesus. Just like the elevation of our works generates an irrelevant church, an elevation unbiblically of the will through the pride of men generates a different Jesus. It generates a weak Jesus, a sissified Jesus, a neutered Jesus, not the Jesus of Scripture, not the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus who is the redeemer of all those who would believe. It generates a different Jesus who has no choice but to humbly stand and knock on the door of your heart and wait upon you to open the door. It's this message that has permeated the modern church that we have to cooperate with God in some way. You know, you've heard it said, God does 99% of the work, but you got to do that 1%. You know, you're floating in the water and God throws you a life preserver, but you have to actually reach out and grab it. That is not the gospel. The gospel says that I was a corpse rotting at the bottom of the ocean. God reached into the ocean, pulled me up, and breathed new life into me. This is the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus. But again, what we see is this proliferation of this elevation of the will, which leads to... The proliferation of the elevation of works and, the, and, and moralism. And really it's theistic, deistic moralism. It's therapeutic. Feel good about yourself. Here is the deal. Is that the gospel destroys pride. The true gospel message absolutely obliterates our pride. I cannot come to Christ with pride in my heart. Because the gospel message tells me. You will not come to Christ. Unless he draws you to him. Unless he draws you to him. And here Moses says. That God is going to send one like him. Who is humble like him. And we ought to listen to him. So let's listen to Jesus. As we get close to closing here. Let's listen to what Jesus says. Philippians chapter 2. This is the words of Paul, words of God, inspired Holy Spirit, words of Jesus, in essence, testifying about himself. <coughs> when he says, do nothing from selfish ambition in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Get rid of this works. This, and we ought to do good stuff. We ought to do good works, but it ought to be an outflow of our salvation and our love for the Lord. But we do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Have the mind of Jesus. 
Jesus tells us to have the mind of him. And what is the mind of Jesus? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we see the humility of Jesus, the humiliation of Jesus, that he was all the things we said he is up to this day, that he's impossible. He's the God who sees me. He's the God who comes to me. He is all of the things we have discovered about him in the preceding weeks, but yet he was willing to humble himself, become as a man, become a man. And go to the cross on our behalf. And here he tells us we ought to have a mind like Jesus. We ought to forsake all pride. Pride in our works. Pride in our will. Pride in the world. Where is your pride today? Where is your pride today? We see that the gospel destroys pride. We see that even in the description of Christians in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are humbled. And so as we get ready to close today, I think about our pride. Where is your pride? Where's your pride and where's your boasting today? <coughs> I was joking as, as we started about uh, not struggling with pride. Again, pride is just such a universal, such a universal and it sneaks up on us in ways that we don't even know. And it sets, us, it sets itself up in opposition against the gospel. And so I'm going to ask Joe to come and sing. And in response, I ask that you examine your hearts according to what we have heard this morning. And I'm going to tell a, an account as we close here today. And I'm going to ask Joe, can I talk about Grandpa for just a minute? So, if I can get through this, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I saw an amazing account of humility just last night. Last night, Joe's grandfather passed away last night, uh, and his grandfather uh, raised him for the most part. Uh, Joe or Harold Whitmer was his name. Uh, he had been very sick for some years. He was in his 80s, uh, older man, and he up until recently was the pastor of the community church right over the hill here. Great man of God. This man has been faithfully serving God, you know, for for decades. And, and he knows everybody in Clarksville. And frequently, <clears throat> when Joe and I are out, uh, we like to meet at Chick fil A during the week. Who doesn't like to meet at Chick fil A? And, uh, and, and I was telling his grandma last night that every time we're there, almost somebody comes by and says, Hey, how's Harold? How's Harold Whitmer? You know, he, 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 he told me the gospel years ago. He, he, he was, Jesus used him to do some a work in my life. Just a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus. But he's been declining health for years, <clears throat> had some heart issues, heart medication was affecting his kidney, so he was on kidney dialysis, and interestingly enough, he was in the nursing home where my wife works, receiving dialysis, <clears throat> and just last week, <clears throat> he felt like the Lord was telling him, you've done enough, and so he comes off of dialysis and goes home. To die. <clears throat> and I'm over there yesterday with Joe and his family. And I see death how it ought to be. He's surrounded by family and friends. He's surrounded by, uh, and even at one point, I missed this part. I wish I'd have been there. But uh, he even starts calling people in and, blessing them. Reminds me of Jacob on his deathbed. What a beautiful picture of finishing well. <clears throat> and I was chatting with his wife last night, and she was relaying to me that even, even in all of his health struggles, as he's in the hospital, as he's struggling, as he's <clears throat> in and out, he's sharing the gospel with every single person he can. I mean, every person. He's right up until the end He's telling them about Jesus. And what a beautiful picture that is of finishing well. But the picture I saw of humility was as his wife, Faye, 
was talking on the phone to somebody and she was relaying how he had gotten to where he is now and, and you know, his health struggles and she was telling them, whoever was on the other end of the phone, about all the different folks he had had the privilege of sharing with the Lord with that he otherwise wouldn't have. And she said one thing that really just kind of caught my eye, and, or caught my ear rather, when she says, we, talking about her and her husband, we are just praying that God would be glorified in all of this. This man was humble, and that even in death, he was praying that God would be glorified, not that he would be glorified. Don't remember me. Preach the gospel. Die. Be forgotten. Glorify God. And he was praying this with his wife. What a powerful image of humility that is. I was overwhelmed by that. We sang in that first song, My Heart Will Sing No Other Name. Jesus. I won't sing my own name. I won't sing the name of a pastor, a politician, a preacher. My heart will sing the name of Jesus that we could be that humble. That we would be humbled by that. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you and we praise you. I pray that every heart right now is singing the name of Jesus. I pray that our hearts are overflowing right now with love for Jesus. I pray that our hearts are exalting now the name of Jesus. He was like Moses. He was humble. God, you say to us, be like Jesus. Be humble. <coughs> God would become a man and go to the cross for my sins. What an amazing thought that is. I can't fathom it. The humility. God, that even now, collectively, our hearts are broken in humility. God, we reject pride. We reject the exaltation of anything other than Jesus right now. We reject the exaltation of ourselves. We reject the exaltation of other people. We reject the exaltation of the will, the exaltation and pride in our works. There is none good, God, and we acknowledge that, but you, Christ in us. So God, as we examine our hearts right now, what is it that you would have us lay down and lay aside? May we do business with you this morning. God, your spirit, your scripture, search us, search our hearts to identify those areas. Maybe it's a religious work even. Trying to take pride in that. Pride in boasting in you and you alone. May we walk and finish and move. Look into a man like Harold Whitmer. That even in death sought to glorify God. Mm. Powerful to me. Humble us, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen.